Within the next decade, this remote site in Western Australia will co-host, along with South Africa, the largest radio telescope the world has ever seen. The Square Kilometre Array will help us to address some of the biggest unanswered questions in cosmology. Are we alone in the universe? How do galaxies form and what is the mysterious substance known as dark energy? Will Einstein's theory of general relativity ever start to show signs of weakness? The purpose of the SKA is to do science. That's what drives us, that's what the governments are funding us to do. The SKA will be a significant improvement on the telescopes that we have right now, um, both in terms of sensitivity, which means that we can look further back in time, in survey speed, which means that we can see uh, more of the sky in a shorter period of time, and also in resolution, which means we get more detail on the images. In radio astronomy, Images of celestial objects can be constructed by detecting the radiation they emit at radio wavelengths. This allows scientists to see structures in the sky that are not visible to optical telescopes. The SKA will act as one giant radio telescope. It will combine the signals from a huge number of small radio receivers using a technique known as interferometry. The receivers have a total collecting area of one square kilometre. A single dish telescope will not only collect light radiation from space, but it also resolves small details in what it's seeing. Now an interferometer uh, is a next, the next step up from a single dish telescope in allowing us to uh, view even finer details by creating effectively what is one large telescope with the same angular resolution as a single telescope of that diameter would have. Radio astronomers hate background noise and the majority of radio signals on our planet come from human activities. So it's important to choose a site for the SKA that was far away from built-up areas. Many nations competed to host the telescope array, but in the end, the organisation voted for a split site between Australia and South Africa, a decision that was cited by many as political as well as practical. One of the things that makes uh, South Africa an ideal site for these low-frequency radio observations is that the site that's been selected in northern South Africa is on the order of 800 kilometers away from the nearest major uh, city, and that is Cape Town. The nearest small town close to the South African site is, uh, is called Carnarvon, and it's got a very low population. In Western Australia, again, uh, very low population density. The nearest town is uh, Geraldton, which is again very close uh, to the site, but doesn't have a huge population density. We have a few uh, sheep uh, and cattle ranches, but indeed, it's a very low population density, meaning that we have uh, low radio frequency interference. Instruments in South Africa's Karoo Desert will cover the bulk of the high and mid frequencies of the radio spectrum, and some of the array will be spread over the rest of the African continent. Meanwhile, the Murchison region of Australia will be sprinkled with millions of dipole antennas covering the low frequency range. As well as the groundbreaking science, the SKA project will also involve some huge engineering challenges in constructing something of such vast scale. The global headquarters of the SKA organisation is based at Jodrell Bank Observatory near Manchester in the UK. I went there to meet some of the scientists and engineers involved with the project. The scientists have great ambition and great vision when it comes to the instruments that they want to build and for an engineer like me working in this sort of environment that's really exciting because they propose difficult problems that engineers have to solve and so that's a, that's a really great challenge. One of the most mind-boggling aspects of the SKA project is the sheer number of data involved in collecting radio emissions and converting them into images. To give you an idea of the, the scale of the data we're going to move, which is something that a lot of people are, are amazed when they hear, the, we, we will be transmitting uh, in about 2020 data which is equivalent to 10 times the global internet traffic of the Earth. The SKA people I met are loaded with incredible facts about the scale of the engineering. For example, they say they'll be using enough optical fibre to wrap around the Earth twice. And the SKA central computer will have the processing power of about 100 million of today's personal computers. But as well as all the stats, the SKA also represents a human story about people collaborating across borders. It's a colossal scientific project 
that can inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers in parts of the world that haven't traditionally been leaders in these fields. So one of the great things about working on a project like the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array, is that one gets to work in a very diverse environment. I think projects like this require global collaboration and this is one of the things that makes them uh, not only great to work on but also uh, allows us to do the kind of research that we wouldn't be able to do if a country was to work uh, by itself. The project is currently in a design stage and construction of the first phase of the SKA is scheduled to begin in 2018. In the meantime, both host nations have built precursor telescope arrays to test some of the technologies. South Africa has the Meerkat Array, while Australia has projects known as ASCAP and MWA. Both Meerkat and ASCAP are our precursor telescopes and they exist on both sites that we're planning to build the SKA on. And they are powerful instruments in their own right and they will have their own science programs. But of course also they are on those sites so they can tell us an awful lot about the practical application of building something in those environments and we can learn a lot from those. And of course the third thing is that, that the, uh, the design and the construction of those telescopes has built both infrastructure and also human capital in those areas so that we have skilled people who understand what is actually quite a specialised area because they've been working on them for, for actually in some cases very many years now in those locations. After the International Space Station and the Large Hadron Collider, the world's next great science project is the Square Kilometre Array. As with previous science projects of this scale, the hope is that the SKA will generate skills and spin-off technologies that will filter into society in the host nations and beyond. The success of projects such as the Large Hadron Collider at CERN has helped the SKA organisation to convince politicians to invest in the project. The truth is that nobody knows for certain yet what new science or technologies will emerge from the SKA project. But if history is anything to go by, then the only thing we can expect is the unexpected.